Hart. I'm the uh, Public Affairs Counselor at the American Embassy. I'm pleased to welcome you here today uh, to a briefing on the results of the FBI Inve Attorney General Amos Wako uh, from the government of Kenya side. Uh, accompanying him are uh, Mr. Philemon Obongo, the Commissioner of Police, uh, Mr. Francis Sang, the Director of the Criminal Investigation Department, and Ms. Uh, Unta Kadula, the Director of Public Prosecution, FBI representative in uh, Kenya, and William Corbett, who is uh, posted here in Nairobi for the FBI as well. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure to welcome several guests from the FBI in Washington, including uh, Thomas Carey, the uh, special agent uh, in charge uh, of the Washington field office which carried out this investigation. I will let him introduce his staff. Uh, at this point, I would like to call upon Ambassador Carson to... Tom, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen of the press, I want to thank all of you for joining us at today's press conference on the release of the conclusion of the FBI report on the tragic death of Father John Kaiser. Before we get started this morning, I want to welcome the Attorney General of Kenya, the Honorable Amos Wako, the Kenyan Police Commissioner, the tragic death of Father John Kaiser on August 24, 2000, came as a shock to all of those who knew him. Although he was an American citizen, Father Kaiser devoted his life to his parishioners, the people of Kenya, and to the teachings of the church. He was a humble and a honest man who provided spiritual guidance to those who needed it, spoke out for social justice for those who were maltreated, and who worked tirelessly to improve the lives of Kenya's rural poor. Father Kaiser's death is a loss that will not be easily forgotten, but we are confident that he will be remembered forever by the many good works that he did and the lives that he touched and changed. In an effort to find out precisely how and why Father Kaiser died, the Attorney General of Kenya, acting on behalf of his government, formally invited the FBI to come to Kenya to participate in this investigation. In the nearly eight months since the start of this case, the FBI has received the full and complete cooperation of the Kenyan police force, the CID, and the Attorney General's office. The FBI has been allowed to pursue every lead and to examine every piece of evidence. It is fair to say that the FBI and the United States Embassy in Nairobi, Kenya have received the same measure of cooperation that we received in tracking down and bringing to justice the perpetrators of the August 7, 1998 bombing of the American Embassy in Nairobi, Kenya. We appreciate the cooperation of the CID and the Kenyan police in this case. It has been excellent. This has not been an easy case for anyone, but I think you will all agree that after hearing from the FBI and reading the report that has been prepared, that you will find it thorough and detail. The facts as we know them have been investigated and discovered, and a conclusion has been made. We will hear this afternoon from the FBI what they have found and what they have concluded. 
Before I call on Mr. Kerry, I would like to invite the Attorney General, the Honorable Amos Waco, to make a brief statement. Thank you. Don Kaisa last year was a tragic event which brought with it a great deal of controversy and speculation, particularly in view of the fact that Father John Kaisa was a well-known Catholic priest who was also a human rights activist. And in that regard, he was a situa, a voice for the voiceless. On the day his body was discovered, the government through the Attorney General immediately got in touch with Ambassador Carson. We did this because the government was desirous to get to the bottom of the matter and wanted all the facts surrounding his death to be unraveled. Consequently, on the same day, the government invited the Federal Bureau of Investigations to assist and participate in the investigations which were being carried out by the Director of Criminal Investigations and his team. It was made clear to the Federal Bureau of Investigations that the government wanted the investigations to be carried out comprehensively. Every lead pursued to its logical conclusion and also expeditiously and also in a transparent manner. As the Attorney General, I gave the assurance that should the investigations result in sufficient prima facie evidence provable in a court of law against any person as being responsible for the death of Father Kaisa, prosecution will ensue as a matter of course. In the conduct of investigations, it was also made clear that any potential witness wish to give his or her statement directly to the FBI officers without or in the absence of the CID officers could do so. Because the perception at that time was that some potential witnesses would not feel comfortable in giving their statements in a free and frank manner to police officers. So it was made clear that such witnesses could give their statements directly to FBI in the absence of CID officers. I am pleased that the FBI and the CID have worked closely together and they have done a thorough and professional job. I commend the FBI officers and the CID officers for a job well done. I will, of course, leave it to the team, FBI team, to discuss the findings of the report which is being released this morning. The CID report will be forwarded to me under our laws and established procedures. I want to assure you that both the FBI report and the CID report are similar. The detail and comprehensiveness of the report is in itself eloquent testimony to our joint commitment to uncover the facts of this case. I now invite Mr. Thomas Carey, the leader of the FBI team, to discuss the report with you. Good morning. Ambassador Carson, Attorney General Waco, Director Sang, Commissioner Abongo, Mrs. Kadula, ladies and gentlemen. 
quickly, I would like to introduce the other members of the FBI team present at this briefing. Supervisory Special Agent Kevin Faust, sitting to Ambassador Carson's right, immediate right. Supervisory Special Agent Joseph DeZeno, sitting to Attorney General Waco's left, immediate left. Then Assistant Legal Attaché Bill Corbett to Mr. DeZeno's left. And lastly, Mr. Thomas Neer of the FBI's National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime on the extreme left. Directly seated behind him is Mr. Wayne Lord, also from the FBI's National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime. These gentlemen are just a few of the FBI investigators and experts who participated in the FBI's investigation into the death of Father John Kaiser. Thousands of man hours were devoted to this endeavor. As you have previously heard, the FBI, in response to requests from the government of Kenya by Attorney General Waco, and with the strong concurrence and support of Ambassador Carson, arrived in Nairobi, Kenya on August 26, 2000 to conduct its investigation into the death of Father Kaiser. Investigators and crime scene experts comprised this team. The FBI later sent other investigators, as well as two experts from the National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime. Over 200 separate interviews were conducted, and numerous investigative leads in the U.S. were completed. Exhaustive forensic analysis, analysis was conducted by the FBI National Lab on dozens of pieces of evidence, including extensive toxicology testing. During the course of this investigation, no indications of crime developed. Witnesses saw only Father Kaiser's truck in the area where he was found subsequently. There were no signs of struggle. There were no footprints or other indications that others were present at the scene. All forensic analysis and findings are consistent with the conclusion that the LBI ultimately reached. All investigative results obtained by Kenyan authorities were then analyzed by the FBI investigators and as well by the FBI's National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime. Kenyan authorities conducted appropriate crime scene investigation. As you know, Dr. Olumbe, the government pathologist for Kenya, conducted the post-mortem examination, which was observed by forensic and senior officials representing Catholic Mission, the United States Embassy, and Kenyan law enforcement, and pathology authorities. You also know that Dr. Olumbe concluded that the cause of death was a gunshot wound to the head. Additionally, the FBI sought out one of the world's leading experts on gunshot wound analysis to independently review this matter. All information known to the FBI was provided to Dr. Vincent J.M. DeMaio, Chief Medical Examiner for the Bear County, San Antonio, Texas Medical Examiner's Office. He is also a renowned author on the subject of gunshot wound analysis. The FBI and Dr. DeMaio reached independent and essentially identical conclusions concerning the manner and cause of Father Kaiser's death. The manner of Father Kaiser's death is most consistent with death resulting from a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. The FBI collaborated with Kenyan authorities. However, we conducted an independent investigation. And the report that we have presented is an FBI report. We believe it is comprehensive and speaks uh, 
extensively to the questions at hand. What I would like to do before we take your questions is I would have the, the experts in each particular aspect of the case uh, make a few comments uh, before we ask, go, go ahead with the uh, question and answer session. At this point, investigating crimes overseas, including being one of the members of the FBI that responded at the invitation of the Kenyan government to the 1998 bombing of the U.S. Embassy here in Nairobi. Another major member of the team has several years experience as an investigator, but just as important to us, he's also a former prosecutor in the state of Florida in the United States. So he brought not only an investigative background, but also a prosecutorial background, which is very important to us. I myself have over 17 years experience in law enforcement, the last 10 of which have been spent specifically in this field of counterterrorism and international terrorism working cases overseas. The lead evidence response team agent that came here initially has extensive overseas experience as well as experience conducting crime scene searches in the United States. Some of the more notable overseas experience he had was he was a member of the evidence response team here in 1998, as well as a member of the evidence creative portion of what my squad, what the work that they do, and that is not the laboratory reports or the behavioral science, which you will hear from shortly. But we look at the totality of the investigation that was done here on the ground as well as back in the United States. This particular investigation was very thorough and very complete. The number of interviews conducted was remarkable. The search of the crime scene was very adequate and professionally done. We gauged the truthfulness of the people we talked to in these interviews. We gauged their ability to know what they were talking about and we gauge the completeness of which they were forthcoming with their information. And in this particular case, we gauged all of these factors to be very positive. We are very comfortable with the findings in this particular case. The FBI team on the ground here had total access to anything and everything we requested. There was no influence whatsoever on a part of anybody within the Kenyan government or the U.S. government as far as the direction the investigators found the facts to lead them. No influence whatsoever. We were given the ability to interview people independently. As was previously mentioned, if they requested an interview outside of the presence of the CID investigators, that was granted. And we do have instances where that did occur. <coughs> And we were very impressed with the professionalism and enthusiasm of our compatriots in the Kenyan CID. There are a number of theories that were set forth during this investigation. Where possible, we ran those theories out to their conclusion and to our satisfaction. Those which were credible all resulted with negative results. I'll turn my comments now over to Bill Corbett for any additional comments on the investigation on the ground. Backgrounds that uh, Kevin had mentioned, including uh, agents who had a number of uh, investigative experiences in Africa, East Africa, and Kenya before, uh, we still thought it worthy that all the investigators be aware of uh, some of the history uh, of Kenya, including uh, history relating to a human rights record, which the government of the United States is uh, on record of being critical of. Uh, nevertheless, those briefs were conducted with the intention of trying to uh, make the investigators aware of what uh, potential offender motive may have existed in considering Father Kaiser's victimology. Uh, we had to understand uh, some of the influential uh, political figures whom Father Kaiser did have an adversary relationship with, and we attempted to uh, consider all of the accounts given to us by not only the political section, but some of Father Kaiser's colleagues, the people whom he had interacted with during his last week, uh, some of his friends whom he had known for decades. Uh, all of that information was taken and considered. Uh, in addition to those 
people. There were a number of factual witnesses who were interviewed, as was mentioned, in a painstaking and very deliberate manner. Uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, the accounts that we were receiving were authentic and genuine accounts rather than any fabrications of someone perhaps trying to interject themselves into this uh, case. Uh, all that information was collected and what started to arise was uh, the fact that no nexuses or no tangible evidence existed from any of the people whom Father Kaiser had this confrontational relationship with and his death. Uh, also what started to emerge were uh, incidents and occurrences that suggested to the investigators that perhaps Father Kaiser was having some sort of degradation in his functioning. And that's how our behavioral assessment unit was brought into this uh, case. Uh, with that and the forensic evidence, all of our information was uh, meticulously collected and given its due consideration and brought back to not just the people who you see here today, but literally scores of FBI agents, analysts, and scientists to try to determine some sort of conclusion. With that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Dr. DeZino from the FBI laboratory. <coughs> Uh, excuse me. We're, we're, due to the press of time, uh, we're going to go to uh, questions and answers right now, but I'll let Mr. Uh, Hart make a comment first. Right. Uh, uh, some of our guests need to move on to other appointments. Uh, please uh, ask a single individual brief question in the interest of letting your colleagues uh, have their turn as well. When called upon, please identify yourself. I ask the agents to identify themselves as they respond as well. Uh, so we will go ahead and start. Uh, Susan. Susan Lene, Associated Press. My question is for the Attorney General. You said that uh, within the day after Father Kaiser's death, you have determined you and the government to contact the U.S. government and the FBI to conduct an investigation so that uh, it would be completely meticulous and there would be no question, expeditiously and in a transparent manner. Subsequently, the FBI investigators and Ambassador Carson have commented how professional and how competent the members of the CID are. My question is, if they're so competent and so professional, why was it immediately necessary to contact the American officials to conduct the investigation? Uh, we, we felt that it was necessary because of the person of Father Kaiser, who was already a public figure, who was involved in a number of human rights activities and so on. He was an American citizen. And we wanted also to be sure uh, that whatever investigations that are carried out uh, also have the confidence and the credibility uh, that uh, they deserve. You'll agree with me that although our CID officers are competent and professional, sometimes the perception that people get, and it's a wrong perception, is that they are not up to it, that they may be a cover-up because of the persons that may be, may be involved in that particular incident or may be perceived to be involved in that particular incident, and we do not want any of that to detract from the professional investigations that our own CID would have carried out. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Question? Mm -hmm. In the back, on the right. I'm Josh Mayer from the Indian Television Network. My question is to the investigators. In the course of your investigations, are you able to establish the reason why Father Kaiser may have inflicted his wound on himself? Uh, I'll let uh, Mr. Tom Nier from the uh, National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime speak to that uh, question. Uh, first, I want to make it clear that uh, the National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime Behavioral Analysis Unit did not come over here to do a post-mortem psychiatric evaluation of Father Kaiser. Uh, rather, because of our law enforcement experience, we bring something to the behavioral table that most psychiatrists don't, which is that we go to crime scenes and we've worked homicide, plenty, hundreds of homicide investigations every year. 
So naturally, in the course of our looking at this case, we were trying to determine, um, first of all, was this a homicide? Or was this a suicide? And I think as you can see in this report, we have listed out factors that are consistent with both of those. As to why this, why Father Kaiser uh, committed suicide, I think there will be a lot of speculation. Uh, certainly, those closest to him may be in a better position to comment on that uh, than we. Uh, however, I think if you read the report and you see some of the stressors that were evident in his life, you may be able to come to some of your own conclusions. I certainly think that you cannot dismiss one of the most significant factors, which is his previous diagnosis uh, by uh, physicians on different occasions of having uh, an illness called uh, uh, manic depression, which is a biological illness uh, treatable uh, with lithium if you're taking that medication. There was no indication he was taking that medication. Um, we know historically uh, the, the, that uh, disease runs in a family and that it's uh, genetic and biologically based. And uh, to a certain extent, uh, that, uh, we believe, uh, certainly impacted on his uh, judgment and may have impaired that compared with or in, in concert with other environmental stressors that he was experiencing. Okay. Thank you very much. Joe Dezino from the FBI Laboratory in Washington, D.C. Uh, we examined uh, Father Kaiser's clothing for gunshot residue, and none of his clothing revealed any presence of gunshot residue, which would indicate a uh, closer relationship between the weapon and Father Kaiser. Uh, Dr. DeMaio also independently uh, assessed the information that was given to him and came to the conclusion that it was a near contact gunshot wound. But again, I mean, he does say out to me. And why is there so much more weight given to his point of view rather than to the I think in reading the report, you should pay close attention to uh, who is writing those autopsy reports their experience and their credentials, and especially their con experience in the area of gunshot wounds. Uh, Dr. DeMaio uh, literally has written the book uh, about gunshot wounds and is quoted by other uh, pathologists in this case, uh, independent of their knowledge of his examination of the evidence in this case. So it speaks fairly highly to his expertise. He never saw that's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, he did see a photograph of the wound. If you look at the report and read the report, you will see that Dr. DeMaio was provided photographs of the autopsy and photographs of the crime scene. But I think, you, I think what you have to do is read the report in its totality, and uh, I think it will be a little bit clearer to you. Thank you. Next question. Okay. Next question. In back. Uh, first time on CNN. Uh, at what point in the investigation did, did the investigators feel that it was a, a suicide and that, that it may not have been uh, foul play? I think uh, generally it was, it was 
the investigation was well underway and getting closer towards the end as the different components of the investigation uh, were finally being completed, the investigative groundwork, forensic, uh, and then ultimately uh, independent review, and then ultimately uh, behavioral science uh, review of the, the whole incident. It was at that point that I think uh, everybody felt very comfortable with the determination that it was a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Mm -hmm. Scott? Scott Stern's Voice of America. I notice in the evidence matrix, not available is listed as the results of the fingernail clippings taken from Father Kaiser's right hand, I believe, which had some blood under those fingernails. Would it be useful in your investigation determining whether someone else might have been at the crime scene to determine whether the blood under Father Kaiser's right fingernails was his own? I'll let Dr. Dezino answer that. We did extensive analysis on blood from uh, Father Kaiser's clothing and several other items at the crime scene using DNA analysis. And all of the blood at the crime scene was determined to be Father Kaiser's own blood. And there's nothing in the evidence that was submitted to us that indicates there was blood from any other individual present at the crime scene. I'm sorry, I was not asking about clothing. I was asking about the fingernail cuttings from the right hand, which in your evidence matrix says the result is not available. We, we did not receive that evidence in the laboratory, but again, there's no indication to us in examining the other bloody items that were submitted to us that anybody else's blood but Father Kaiser's is present at the crime scene. Mm -hmm. Further questions? Carl? Uh, Carl Vick, Washington Post. Two questions. One, was there blood on the truck? I see that in the matrix. Yes, we re did receive a small uh, chip of paint from the truck, which had blood, which again uh, was contained Father Kaiser's blood. Which is 30 feet from the body. I, I don't have the facts. Anybody know where? Can someone speak to this, yeah. Bill? Yeah, I think it's approximate. Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 there was uh, trace evidence of Father Kaiser's blood uh, from uh, on the vehicle, but uh, we think that is consistent with what the medical examiner and uh, the medical observers saw as one superficial wound on Father Kaiser's hand, or I should say a, a scrape, not a wound. Uh, but collectively, I think it's important to understand that there were no signs, no uh, None of the medical examiners saw any signs of a struggle or defensive wounds. And that bears into the question of uh, if there were no, no defensive wounds, was the victim uh, out there with someone else or not? So, so the blood in the truck was from an earlier scrape of his hand? Well, pr presumably. There's, there's no manner to test for when that blood was deposited at that scene. <laughs> It, it's blood on the truck that's Dr. Kaiser's, My other question or Father Kaiser's, I'm sorry. Does the, does the, the BAU unit, do you conduct a, a post-mortem autopsy, a, a psychological autopsy? That's a favorite term, but we don't we don't use that term. That years ago we used that term. We don't we don't use that term, and we did not conduct what we would call a psychological autopsy. Again, as I indicated earlier, part of the behavioral analysis perspective, which is very unique actually, is looking at cases from a law enforcement perspective. And what's incorporated into into that is not just looking at the forensics and the and the results of the autopsy, but also looking at the individual, the victim himself. What has the victim, when we came into this case, we didn't know if it was a homicide, a suicide, or an accident. So we examine all features. And what's very important is learning about who this victim was. And what we noticed were several. Um, what we wanted, what we look for, is there something about this victim that would have elevated his risk of being a victim of a homicide or a suicide? And I think as we've articulated in the report, uh, clearly we believe that uh, looking at the totality of the circumstances, that this was more consistent with uh, suicide. But we, again, it was not, we did not come over here to do a psychiatric uh, autopsy or a psychological autopsy per se. Do we have a question from the Kenyan press? Yes, ma'am. Um, 
I think that's a very good question, and uh, that's why I'm happy, in fact, that the FBI can, under their laws, release the report, which is similar to the report that the CID have, and which, as you are aware, under our laws, police normally investigate. They never tell the public what is in their report until a prosecution or an inquest has been ordered. That's when, for the first time, the public gets to know what information the police have gathered. So I'm, I'm happy that under the U.S. system, it is possible to release the investigation report, which has been released today. And I hope that you members of the press will almost serialize it, so that at least everybody knows what is contained in this report, uh, which is, to me, thorough and comprehensive. As I said in my statement, the CID component of the report is being forwarded to me, and I will study it and then see what to do with the report. Excuse me, as a follow-up to that question, what is to stop you now from requesting an inquest so that the CID can release its report to the public? The reference to the inquest will not in itself release the report. It can't. The report will only be known, say, if, if an inquest is ordered, a public inquest is ordered, then the public will get to know what's contained in this report through that inquest. In, in other words, if I decide today that an inquest must be held, that in itself will not make me release that report. But as I stated earlier, what is in that report is actually the same as what is now being released through good fortune here that under the laws of the United States, an investigative report can be released. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. CNN, come uh, back. CNN again. Um, immediately after his death, uh, the people that lived and worked with Father Kaiser said that he was in fear of his life. Uh, to the investigators, did you, in your investigation, did you talk uh, with anything that, that may have legitimized the uh, response? Kevin. There were several theories put forth as to the cause and manner of this death. One of those, of course, that Father Kaiser was in fear of his life. And I think as you heard mentioned here earlier, uh, we did uh, consider that, of course, in our investigation. Uh, Father Kaiser, as was mentioned earlier up here by one of the panel, uh, had adversaries within the Kenyan government uh, because of his, his stand on some particular issues here in Kenya. And so therefore that definitely was one of the things that we looked at. Because we were able to do such a thorough job of interviewing people and looking at evidence here in Kenya, we've come away satisfied that there is no credible evidence whatsoever that exists that points towards Father Kaiser's demise at the hands of somebody else. Uh, whether he was in fear of his life I mean, people told us that. I, I couldn't comment on what Father Kaiser what might be going through his mind at that time. I don't have that luxury. But that was certainly one of the avenues that was looked at by the FBI. And again, we've concluded there's no credible evidence to suggest that anybody else had a hand in this uh, tragic loss. Uh, the time for Time Magazine, my question is to the Attorney General. There's mention in the report to Congress uh, that the FBI in their investigations found evidence of uh, individuals acting on Minister Sankuli's behalf in, in specific criminal acts. And I'm just wondering in this kind of atmosphere of, of uh, transparency and, and the US system, when can we expect the, the uh, report on, on those criminal acts to be released? And can you elaborate a little bit more on what those acts are and they, they represent, uh, they, were, they were perpetrated by people who believe to that, that on an individual that they believe to be a, a threat to our minister Yeah, uh, th th those, that's a report, fortunately, which is it's not coming to me, it's going to the Congress, and therefore that phraseology is there. I'll await for my own report, they are similar. When I get it and read it thoroughly, that's when I'll make up a decision on the issue. Sometime during that period, he was also 
roll for some kind of an accident. There was significant damage to his car once he arrived at the night of the night. Has anything come up during the course of the investigation which would suggest a point of contact during that time when he spent his missing hours? Do you want to take it? Uh, Kevin, why don't you start it, and then I think Dr. Dezino can sure. do it. There, there was no credible evidence located to, to suggest what happened during those three hours. What's important to consider is his, uh, the witness statements from the gas station and the specific, specific evidence gathered at the gas station. And, and I'll let uh, Dr. Dezino talk a little bit more about uh, those particular examinations. What, what is important to my team of investigators, the team of investigators from the FBI, is that the witness statements from the gas station are corroborated by the actual uh, physical evidence that was gathered there. Uh, so we're very confident in, in those in that particular result. Uh, it is very difficult for us to account specifically for those three hours because no witnesses were discovered, uncovered, or ever came forward to talk about where he might have been during that time period. Just one other comment uh, on, on his uh, whereabouts that evening. Uh, I think it's important to understand that Father Kaiser left uh, two separate venues, both the Mill Hill home, the guest home, and the bishop's residence in Ingong. On both of those occasions, he surprised the people of those house, houses, his friends and colleagues, because there was no rational explana explanation why he was leaving or where he was leaving. And on both separate accounts, people were quite surprised uh, that he had left and had not confided in anyone where he was going or why he was going. Uh, he was also seen later on that evening, as you'd mentioned, in a corner of Kiambu. And what he was actually doing in Kiambu uh, cannot be rationally explained. Uh, when he showed up next at that gas station, uh, there was damage to his car that uh, Dr. Dezino will talk about here in a moment. But uh, the other thing I would want to mention is we tried to uh, retrace the steps from Ngong, from Nairobi, and from Kiambu to Naivasha, uh, looking for the origin of that accident. And as broad a net that we cast, we could not come up with the origins of that accident. And also worth mentioning is upon his arrival at the gas station, there was no account of him being followed, and uh, to the contrary, the witnesses who gave very credible testimony explained that he was in a very relaxed manner and was not in any duress or operating in any sense of urgency. In regards to that accident, the laboratory <coughs> tested paint from the damaged side of the truck, and it was a green paint, and it was determined to be a green paint smear. Uh, however, Two components of that green paint indicate to us that it's that green paint is not characteristic of automotive paint, but we do not know the source of that green paint smear. From the Kenyan press, yes. Okay, from Family Media. Uh, the question goes to the Attorney General. You are telling us that the, you called in the FBI for help because maybe Kenyans will not have accepted the report from the CID here, yeah? and then you come in to say that you are happy that the report under the American Constitution rather can be released to the Kenyans. So which promise are you giving the Kenyans in that such reports? Because I think that's why the Kenyans doubt such reports that are released by the CID. So what promise is there that the law will permit or rather give Kenyans the information that they want about this case? No, as you know, <coughs> We are carrying out a comprehensive reform of our penal, penal laws and procedures. And part of the benefit of this joint effort between the, the Director of Criminal Investigations and FBI, to me, is to see the types of procedures, how matters are investigated, and to learn from each other. Obviously, we have learned much more from FBI because of their length of experience in areas such as this. And I can assure you, and the Commission of Police is here, and the Director of CID is here, I think they have learned a lot on how to conduct investigations of this nature, on the procedures that have to be followed, and so on. And we shall, of course, take that into account when we reform our laws. Obviously, I think the issue of secrecy of investigations tends to uh, make people suspicious, generates a lot of suspicion 
absolutely for nothing. And it's one area that we must look at, that our process of investigations, whilst they should be not be jeopardized by too much open, openness, in other words, revealing whatever is being done prematurely, but must, along the line, be as transparent and as open as possible. That's one of the lessons that we have learned, and I'm sure will be reflected in the, the reforms that we, we are undertaking. Uh -huh. You are aware, aware, of course, that we have already published the criminal law amendment bill, which incorporates quite a number of these things. Uh, two more questions, I'm afraid, only not yet asked. Huh? I just want to ask the investigators, were there any fears that because there's a three-day gap between when the body was found and your arrival in Kenya, that the quality of your investigation would be compromised? Obviously, one of the things the investigators will take into account is that time period that passed and the ability for tampering of evidence or the ability to uh, talk to witnesses, uh, to discourage or encourage people to come and speak with us and so forth. In this particular case, we found no evidence whatsoever of any tampering of any physical evidence. The crime scene, we were taken immediately to the crime scene upon arrival, shortly after arrival, and we found the crime scene to be very much in the same similar uh, fashion in which it was uh, located on that day. Uh, again, we were, the important factors to us is we were giving complete liberty to talk to and examine anything we requested and anything we wished. Uh, we were not steered in any way whatsoever. Um, and again, the independent analysis of the work that was done prior to the FBI's arrival uh, by those outside uh, make us feel very comfortable in coming to this conclusion uh, that put our fears to rest about the time period that had elapsed. Obviously, the best case scenario is to be there right away. Because of the distance, that was not possible. But we are very pleased and confident that uh, we would have found the same things. Mm -hmm. One last question, I'm afraid. Uh, please note that we do have two resident FBI agents in uh, Nairobi who will continue to be available. Okay, I'll, I'll try to I'll try to speak to it briefly. Uh, I think there are several points here. One, uh, the FBI itself came up with its own judgment, independent of Dr. DeMaio, and independent of other factors. Two, you mentioned other pathologists that were present. Neither pathologist is an expert in forensic pathology and gunshot wound analysis. Dr. DeMaio is, and as in fact, as you can see in this report, and as his curriculum vitae has written extensively and done extensive studies in this regard, uh, I think what he said eloquently speaks uh, for his analysis of, of the report. And I think further, uh, Bill Corbett uh, did speak to uh, Dr. Katui. Uh, we attempted to additionally speak to Professor Arroyo, and I think we've been unsuccessful in that regard. But I would let Bill just say a few words of comment, and then after that, just thank you all for, uh, for coming to this press conference with Bill. Well, there was actually concern when we first had uh, Dr. Katui's report uh, made available to us. Clearly it seemed inconsistent what uh, we were looking at. And when I personally had uh, spoke with her, uh, be, besides uh, offering to me that in fact her background is, is a general practitioner and not uh, forensic or patho uh, pathology, uh, she did uh, discuss her recollection that uh, Dr. Olumbe mentioning space between the muzzle and uh, Father Kaiser's head. And her recollection was that that space was feet. Uh, uh, and we believe that that space actually was a lot closer than feet. And I know Professor Onyongo was representing the Catholic Church. I've never seen a formal report. Uh, he's never made anything available to us. I've heard that his uh, opinion uh, may be in consistent with what Dr. DeMaio and Dr. Alumbe have concluded, but uh, again, I think the, uh, a, a close uh, methodical study of that physical evidence would probably speak for itself. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, now, I think we've, we've said that we've, uh, we'll follow up with other of the agents that are here, but we're under time constraints too, okay? Thank you for coming.
what, what percentage of suicides occur in homes and what percentage on main highways? What percentage? You know anything about that? I don't, I don't have any uh, data uh, available right now on uh, location of suicides uh, to answer your question. Okay, thank you. Yes,